welcome to episode 21 of the Rock is George podcast. I'm your host, George Dion. If you're listening to the Rock is George podcast, you probably found us at anchor.fm slash rockisgeorge or through rockisgeorge.com. You can stream the Rock is George podcast on all major streaming platforms, including Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Pocket Cast, there's so many podcasting platforms. I can't name them all. You can stream on whichever one you like. I got another great interview for you today with legendary rock drummer Carmine Apice. Uh, my apologies to Carmine. I referred to his last name as Apice. I swear I've heard it both ways. Uh, I kind of have a similar last name where it's pronounced Dion, but people call me Dion or Dion. So. I'm sure that Carmine understood. If the name Carmine Apice doesn't ring a bell, certainly his body of work will. Uh, Carmine got his start back in the late 60s with the psychedelic rock band Vanilla Fudge. Uh, It's a band that he's still in today, in 2021. From Vanilla Fudge, he moved on to form the blues rock band Cactus in 1970 with fellow Vanilla Fudge member Tim Bogart. Uh, Bogart and Apice teamed up with Jeff Beck in 1973 to form Beck, Bogart, and Apice. It was more of a bluesy style form of music. Uh, 1977, Carmine was a part of Rod Stewart's band. He co-wrote Do You Think I'm Sexy? He co-wrote Young Turks and a couple other songs with Rod. He played drums on Paul Stanley's solo album from Kiss. In the 80s, Carmine formed King Cobra with Marcy Free, David Michael Phillips, Mick Sweeter, and Johnny Rod. Uh, That band is still together today. Uh, It's fronted by Paul Shortino. King Cobra started off as a heavy metal band and kind of morphed into a radio rock band, more radio-friendly songs. They had a song in the movie Iron Eagle. In 1989, Carmine moved on to Blue Murder with former... White Snake guitarist John Sykes and bassist Tony Franklin, who played on probably 500 albums in the 80s and still playing on albums today. Uh, 93, Carmine formed Mother's Army with Joe Lynn Turner, Jeff Watson of Night Ranger, Bob Daisley, and Ansley Dunbar. Uh, 90s were a little rough for that style of music because it was kind of like Blue Murder, the hard rock, metal stuff, and King Cobra. Uh, 1995, uh, Carmine Apice put together this project he called Guitar Zeus, where he brought together all these legendary guitarists to play on his album. It was kind of a first since a drummer was putting together a guitar-heavy album. He had Tim Nugent, Brian May from Queen, Richie Sambora from Bon Jovi, Ingve Malmsteam on that album. Uh, He had several albums under the Guitar Zeus name. In fact, Guitar Zeus is celebrating its 25th anniversary, and we're going to talk a little bit about that with Carmine, on which he compiles all the material that he ever put together for the project. In 2011, Carmine teamed up with his brother Vinny Apice for Drum Wars, I'm not sure if there was any albums put together, but they played live shows together. Vinny, of course, played for Dio and Black Sabbath and many others in his career. Uh, Currently, Carmine has a project out on Cleopatra Records. It's called the Apice Perdomo Project. It's Carmine teaming up with guitarist Fernando Perdomo. The name of the album is Energy Overload, and Carmine and I talk about that right out the gate so without further ado here's carmine apiece hey i got the last name right are you still living in la carmine no i don't live in la anymore i live in florida now i've been here for a year and a half moved here right in the middle of the uh, pandemic got an amazing house with a studio attached to the, in the guest house and been doing a lot of work i did this whole album that we're talking about today uh generated from my studio and uh i just love it you know, i walk through the garage turn on the computer the drums are in place they're all mic'd i can go into any point in time and, and play and it has the same sound even if i record like last week 
I recorded, uh, I'm recording a woman called Lisa G. She's a really talented lady. And uh, so we, we got three songs so far done. I'm working on two more for a little EP for Deco Records. And, uh, you know, I went in there and I said, oh, I really like the drum trap. I did a month and a half ago, but I don't like those two bars of the second verse. So I'm going to go in and fix it. So I went in, I played it. It has the same exact sound as a month and a half ago. It went in perfectly, you know. And in, the, in the old days, you know, you, you can't do that, you know, because when you bring the drums back in, you know, it's going to set up exactly the same with the mic positions, exactly the same. <coughs> it's not going to sound exactly the same. You know, so it's really good. That these drums never move from that room. And uh, I love it. And then I'm the engineer now, too, which is wild. Yeah, it's kind of good having it, because in the old days, you didn't have as much control over it. The old days, hey, I'm going to do a session, we're going to do a Vanilla Fudge track, so uh, whoever, Thomas, go go get my drums, let's set them up in the studio, uh, we do that, so he's got to go get the drums set up in the studio, and then we and then we got to get a drum sound. By the time we do all that, it's like you're in the studio four hours before you even start recording, you know? And by the time you start recording... You're already a bit fried. You know? <laughs> so now it's so easy. And we did this album just totally by the internet. It doesn't sound it. Let's just clarify the album that we're talking about here. It's Apathy Perdomo Project. The name of the album is Energy Overload. It comes out on Cleopatra Records on September 24th, 2021. Is this the first time that you've recorded through the internet or the first time you've recorded in your home studio through the internet? No, this is the first time in my own studio. Before I've done it, you know, but I, I went to studios and recorded and then they, they would email, you know, the drum tracks to wherever. Like when we did uh, the Vanilla Fudge Stop in the Name of Love, which we just released recently, uh, we did it in the studio and then we emailed it to my friend uh, Jorgen uh, Carlson, who plays bass for Government Mule in L.A., and we got Tim Bogart to play on it before he passed away. And that's when we noticed the drums sounded weird because too much leakage of other things on it. So it was, I was planning to go into the studio that we recorded at, along with Tim's performance, and then put new drums on it. And then COVID hit, and that was the end of that, right? Right. And and then uh, that was that was like March, and then in uh, June we moved to Florida, and I built my own studio here. You know, which I didn't really build anything. I just put the I had a guest house, I have a living room and a kitchen dining room area that I took over, and I put my my brother Vinny built me the computer with the uh, Cubase and the, and the, all the equipment I needed for the mic inputs and all that. He showed me how to use it, and I started recording it out, and then. Once I got the sound I started liking, I put in some old bass drums and it sounded really good. I said, you know, I'm going to replace the drums. And I did that. And that's the track, the drums that we use, and it sounds awesome. Ah. So then I just, then I start, you know, and part of it was due to working with Fernando. Because when he called me, I was just setting up the studio. And I, I got the call via Tom Dowd, you know, the great producer, Tom Dowd. And he, his daughter called me because Tom passed away. And he said, this, Tom was working with this guy before he passed away. And, he, and this guy, Fernando, wanted me to play on his album, or a album, or a couple of tracks. So I said, oh, that might be interesting to me. The more I record in the studio, the better I'm going to get at engineering the stuff, you know? So basically, I, I, that's how I thought about it. And then when we started recording, I said, wow, this guy's really good. And then we kept recording and recording and... Uh, we ended up with 18 songs recorded, instrumental songs. I thought that was interesting because, you know, I hadn't done an instrumental album pretty much in my whole career. And my friend that owns Cleopatra, I called him up and I said, I'd like to put this out. What do you think? And he agreed and we, we did a video budget and a little bit of a advance and we, we put picked 12 songs and there you go. Right in the middle of all that, I said, well, I'm, I'm ready now to do that Vanilla Fudge track. Yeah, so I redid the track and I got my buddy Pat Regan to mix it. And it came out fantastic. I don't know if you ever heard that yet, but it's really good. 
Oh, I took a crash course in Carmine Apathy this week, but I've always been a fan of your more 80s-oriented stuff. Blue Murder, King Cobra. We'll get to... You'd be interested to know we're doing a King Cobra album. That's awesome, and I got a question about that coming up later, so we'll keep with Fernando Perdomo, and we'll work our way back. I got you covered for the whole year. The album Energy Overload is an all-instrumental album, but I don't feel that it gets boring at any time, and you guys have some great chemistry for two guys that aren't in the same room. Exactly. You know, you know the first thing I gave them, I said, look, I wrote this song. It's on, uh, I wrote these songs that I have on GarageBand on my iPad. So why don't I send you one, and you do, what you, do your magic on it, send it back to me, and then I'll put drums on it. So we did that, and that song became Thunder. That was the very first track we recorded. I had my uh, a Swingle drum set on that. I didn't have the actual drum set that I ended up with. And then I said, wow, that's pretty good, you know? So I said, let me send you another one. So I sent him the one that's called Funky Jackson. And, I, and again, I wrote these myself. I played all the instruments on, on the iPad on the Garage Band. And uh, sent him that, and he sent it back, and that sounded great. And he said, well, let me send you one. So then he sent me one that ended up being a little Havana, because he's Cuban, you know? And and uh, so I, I, I liked that. I played it, kind of like a heavy rock Latin thing. And then at the end of it, I said, well, I'm going to add something to it. So I added this really fast double bass drum kick-ass cactus hot for teacher kind of shuffle with accents and drum fills. I said, see if you can put something to that. So he did, and I was blown away at what he put on it. And that became Big Havana. So then I said, that's interesting that you wrote a track to my drum track. I have a, I have a, another drum track. Let me give it to you. See what you can do with it. So I sent him another drum track. And that became Rocket to the Sun, which was our first video. And I said, wow. He says, I really like writing to your drum tracks because your drum tracks have dynamics, a feel where you know it's going to change into a verse or a chorus or, or, or a bridge. You could actually feel it. And he said it was really easy to write to your drum tracks using your dynamics and everything, where your drum fills a place and, and the actual rhythms that you're using. I said, wow, okay. I said, you know what? I have more drum tracks. So I sent him all together. We did five drum tracks that are on the record that he wrote to the drum tracks. And the next video is another one of those. It's called uh, Flower Child. That's coming out uh, tomorrow, or today, actually. Perfect. Today, tonight? Yes, today. So I wanted to ask you, you mentioned that you use GarageBand by Apple. Is that where you crafted most of the music and then went to the drums and sent it over, or did you guys create together within the app? Well, on the songs that I wrote, yes, I would send him my demo, and then he would take my demo and get the chord structure and the arrangement and whatever melodies I had, and maybe he had to add a couple of melodies here and there. And then he would send it back to me with a click, and then I would put drums on it. Because the drums that are on the demo are very basic. They're played with my fingers. Right. You know? And uh, that's how we did a bunch of the songs. I thought it was cool that you guys had a couple of songs on the album that originally had words, but this time Fernando plays the melody lines of where the vocals would be. You did that with Maybe I'm Amazed, and again with Rod Stewart's Do You Think I'm Sexy? Well, because I was a co-writer on Rod Stewart's song, right? And I played on the original. And uh, I used to do a, a thing in L.A. called uh, uh, Come Out of Peace and Those Jazz Guys at a jazz club. And we did a rock, reggae, jazz, a uh, jazz rock, reggae version of Do You Think I'm Sexy with a, with a chick singer. So I had that arrangement on my iPad as well. I put it on my iPad for myself just to have it. And then I sent it to him, and him being Latin, he said, oh, yeah, let's definitely do this as a reggae. So, so he's, I sent it to him, and he sent it back to me, and then I put the drums on it. And he did all these little nuances of things in it that were really cool. But when he, sent, when he did it with the, 
with the uh, Wawa, the guitar was talking. And it was good. And then at the end, we did the, the riff that, that was my riff that I played, you know, like the drum breaks over the riff, the reggae kind of drum uh, fills. And it came out great. And then he had Maybe I'm Amazed. And he said, would you want to play on that? He said, I was going to use it for something else. I said, yeah, let me hear it. So I heard it. I said, yeah, I'll definitely play on that. He, he was working with this, with the, uh, the female singer of, uh, of Pink Floyd. And I said, and we said, we should put her backgrounds on there, like a big gospel background, you know, to make it a little unique. So we did that. And then again, the guitar, you know, the way you play guitar, it's, it's talking to you. And only because you already know the melody and, and the lyrics, so the guitar can actually talk to you. On the original songs, <clears throat> this guitar was talking too, but you, nobody knew the lyrics. Because there were never any lyrics to that song, you know, or any of the songs. But like he's, he's a great, he's got a great ear for melody. And he plays bass, guitar, and keyboard, and drums. And he's a very, very talented guy. You have a long history of teaming up with legendary guitar players. You have the Guitar Zeus 25th anniversary set coming out shortly. Uh, is this an anthology or is this a best of Guitar Zeus? It's, that's an anthology. It's, uh, we, we added three new tracks. One of them has Tommy Thayer from Kiss on it. One of them has uh, Derek Sherinian, the keyboard player, playing like a lead guitar on a track and then we have another one that has uh, Chris uh, Bigiani from uh, from uh, this group I'm uh, producing called Kodiak Young Band like a Van Halen yeah and then there's some tracks that were never on a, a Bumbleful track and a track from a guitar player from Japan and and uh, so there's some bonus things and there's in the 25th anniversary package there's a bundle you can get uh, a Carmine Carmine logo, face logo, medallion made of sterling silver with a, on the same chain with a, a guitar uh, pick, right? And then we did interviews with the guitar players and Tony and me and Kelly and created this thing. It's in the new booklet with some of the new some of the guitar players. And then there's a, a t-shirt, a guitar Zeus t-shirt, and a new picture of my uh, I mean, my new image that I autographed in pictures. And that's like the bundle one. And then there's one you can buy without all that stuff, which is just four LPs, three CDs, and the booklet. You know, but even the, this three CDs have some like tracks that have no guitar on it. So if you're a guitar player, you could play along with me, Timmy, uh, Timmy, me, Tony, and uh, and Kelly. And some of them have no vocals. You could sing along. And some of them have just a vocal and, and no lead guitar. You know, so there's a, so a bit of bonus stuff in there that's really interesting. Oh, it's definitely the complete package, and you got some heavyweights on there like Brian May and Slash and Richie Sambora. One of the artists that caught my eye was for the song Jeezy Blues. It's Seymour Duncan and Steven Seagal. Is that the Steven Seagal, the action star of the 90s? John McElroy plays rhythm guitar and a few little lead fills here and there. Did you say John McElroy? Yeah, I said John McEnroe, the tennis player. <laughs> How did you get those guys on the album? Steven Seagal was, uh, I did a charity event with Richie Sambora when Richie was doing it. So, and Steven was on the charity thing, and he played guitar. And he was okay, you know, it wasn't like brilliant, but he was okay. So, I got to know him, and, and, and we were talking about my guitars here. So I said, hey, you want to play on it? He goes, yeah, I'll play on it. But we already had all the songs cut already, so uh, I also asked Seymour Duncan because you know Seymour Duncan is a great player, besides just a great pickup. So I thought, well, why don't I do a blues with Seymour Duncan playing rhythm to Steven Seagal, and then vice versa. Yeah. So so that's what we did, and uh, I played on a like a on the back of a guitar, I believe. He was banging on an acoustic guitar as, as time. And it was it was good. It came out really good. And Seymour was a great player, and and, and Stephen, you know, he played like Stephen, you know, <laughs> and he loved blues. He loves blues, you know. And then uh, I was doing also doing at one point I was going to do a an eight hundred number sale of guitars in the in the I don't know what it was late nineties, 
And because I released it around the world, and around the world, the guitars is it did great, great in Japan, great in Europe. I got royalties from Europe. We got big advances for publishing, and you know, big advances for the record. And, you know, I made good money off it. And it was, you know, I sold two hundred thousand records everywhere but America. <clears throat> I thought, you know, maybe the way to go was an eight hundred number. So I, I, I did this eight hundred number. Unfortunately, the guy who was putting it together with me messed it up and didn't do it right. But I ended up in a place with an agency that I met John McEnroe, you know, and he said, I, I had a copy of the double album and I gave him one. He said, oh man, I would have loved to play it on. So I said, you play guitar? He goes, yeah. I go, well, maybe we can work something out. So I brought him in the studio and I added him to an already mixed track. Right on the on the 24 track at the time we were using tape, you know, and I inserted him into the into the mix, playing rhythm and a couple of little fills here and there. So now so now we have Steven Seagal and Joe Macarell on the album, I thought, which was unique. <laughs> and, and one more thing, and the fact that a drummer did a guitar album, which was the original concept back in 1992 when I was doing uh, Mother's Army with. Uh, Jeff Watson, Bob Daisley, and Joe Lynn Turner. But, you know, grunge was in, and you know we were kind of dinosaurs, and we were out. But Jeff Watson got a, uh, a solo deal. I said, man, I've been trying to get a solo deal for 10 years again. I did one in 82, it's 92, I want another solo deal. You just come out of a band, and you get a solo deal like that. I said, what do I got to do, a guitar album to, to get a solo deal? You know, <laughs> I said, I'll call it Guitar Gods. And we were messing around with the name Zeus. I said, no, I'll call it Guitar Zeus. And we laughed. I, I was kidding. <laughs> and then I went to bed that night, and I started thinking, I said, you know, that's a freaking great idea. A drummer doing a guitar album. Then when it comes out, I could do drum magazine press. I could do guitar magazine press. I could do rock press, you know, and promote it the hell out of it that way. So I said, all I need is a guy that can put it together. So it took me a couple of years to find the guy to put it together. But in that intro, I found Kelly Keeling to write the songs with me. I found Tony Franklin to do it with me. And I found Tony, uh, not Tony Frank, uh, Ted Nugent. And I found Brian May. And I found the guys from King's X. And I thought if I can get Ted Nugent, Brian May, and the guys from King's X on an album with me and Tony and Kelly, it would draw in other guys. And exactly what happened. Here we are, 25 years, still talking about it. Yeah, unbelievable. Hey guys, Rock is George here for the Rock is George podcast whiskey break. Uh, today I have a fantastic bourbon from a fantastic bourbon company. They're called Mitchters. Absolutely love this company. After bumping into a rep at Julio's Liquors in Westboro, Massachusetts, uh, let us try quite a few of the expressions. I like them all. Every single thing that Mitchers make is fantastic from the bourbon to the whiskey to the sour mash to the rye. It's all good. It's inexpensive. It's about $40 a bottle here in Massachusetts. Uh, your mileage may vary. Uh, I have the Kentucky Street Bourbon Whiskey by Mitchers. It's small batch, which means not much when it comes to taste. It just means they don't have a very big facility, probably. <laughs> But it's also single barrel, and that means that they don't do any blending. It all comes from one barrel or multiple barrels, but what they put in a bottle is from... It, it gets complicated. <laughs> anyway, um, the bottling strength is 91.4 proof, which puts it at 45.7% alcohol by volume. It is placed in a fire-charred New American white oak barrel for finishing. And the difference, once again, between a whiskey and a bourbon is the bourbon has got corn used as one of the uh, grains. That's usually the main grain ingredient when it comes to bourbon. Uh, Mitchters describes this bourbon as rich caramel with balanced vanilla, which are two things you'll see in almost all whiskeys. Stone fruit notes, smoky depth with an oak finish. Well, let's give it a try. So you're definitely getting that oaky finish and the caramel and vanilla that you want to see in almost all good whiskeys and bourbons. 
Uh, it's a little bit of smoke there. There's a nice sweetness, but it's not too sweet. It's got more of a um, grain bite than it has a sweet bite. So I can see them saying stone fruit, but uh, kind of that uh, little spiciness, even though it's it's not a rye. And, and I like the more deeper flavors and stuff like that. Uh, once again, it's Mitchers Small Batch Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey. $40. You can't go wrong. If they don't have the bourbon, try one of the other expressions because they are fantastic. Now let's get back to Carmine Apiece. Do you think that the art of the guitar is dying? You have these great guitar players on Guitar Zeus that were heroes to me growing up in the 70s and the 80s, and I could name them all and recognize them all, but the guitar players of today, I don't really see that there's any standouts. Yeah, and you know what? Number one, all the pop music changed to all the computerized stuff and everyone sounds the same. Now, number two is the fact that there's all these downloads now and you don't even know who's playing guitar or drums. Or, there's no idols, there's no new idols of any sort except pop guys, you know, pop girls, or rap guys. <laughs> you know? So because of, of that, the, the music stores are suffering. The music uh, companies that make guitars, drums, and all that are suffering. And there's no radio anymore. And so all these, all these together give you no, no new icons. That's true. And we could take someone like Maroon 5, who's considered a popular rock band today. But do you know who the guitar player is? I don't either. No. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Having grown up in the 70s and the 80s, you know, you pretty much know everybody in the band. You know everybody. I mean, even the, you know, we have a show called Hanging and Banging. I got this woman, uh, I don't even know her name. She's a, a singer of a group called Plush. Mariah Formica. And we have the drummer of Seether, but I didn't know who, the name of the drummer of Seether. Do you? Uh, no, I don't. Is it uh, Casey something? No, 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 it isn't. Ah, the band Seether. I was thinking the group that sang the song Seether, Veruca Salt. But, you, I mean, that's a perfect example now. Right, exactly. And now people get famous. You know, they got, you know, 42 million views on YouTube and they can sell out Madison Square Garden. Yeah, you know, exactly. Like the Black Keys. Right, exactly. You know, I read the thing that this group sold out two nights at the Madison Square Garden. The Black Keys, I said, who the hell are the Black Keys? <laughs> <laughs> I never heard of them, right? Two nights at the garden. Who's in them? I don't know. <laughs> I agree with you, man. It was a lot better in the 70s and 80s. People say to me, well, what new, what new groups or new guitar players or drummers do you listen to? I said, tell you the truth, I don't even have a clue because I used to sit in the radio, turn on the radio and listen to a new group and they'll say, you know, this is the name of the group and then the you read it in a magazine, here's a drummer, here's a guitar player. Or you go to the record store, you look at their album. I said, that does not, I said, I don't sit around all day on YouTube and look for new groups. It's like millions of them. That's kind of really the only way to discover new bands these days. If you're listening to like Pandora on Shuffle and they'll play something related to the stuff you like. Or on YouTube, they'll be like, you may also like this video. You have to really seek it out yourself these days. Yeah, but, you know, it's like, I got better things to do than to do that. I mean, I ride in the car, I listen to different music. To tell you the truth, I've been listening to k which is a Christian station. You know why? Because it's, you know, I've become more of a Christian, first of all, but the music is cool. Drumming-wise, it's very tribal, different. And I'm enjoying the different drumming patterns on all these different songs. As well as the message is a positive message, you know, and it's, and the good productions and, and interesting. But I don't have a clue who's playing drums. If it's if it's a drummer or a machine. Actually, my wife and I listen to K Love a lot. It has a really good message. You're right about that. I wrote three Christian songs, and I utilize that kind of drumming in those songs. And I, I'm I'm involved with this. Wow, really crazy church down here in Florida. It's like a revival church. It's unbelievable. The band is amazing. And when I saw them, they had electronic drums. I got them a D drum set. After I got them the set, 
I realized this drummer, this 28 year old kid, is freaking amazing. So um, next year I'm planning to write a book. I'm going to write a book about Christian drumming with this kid. Yeah. There are no books about Christian drumming today. What kind of dog do you have? He sounds kind of mean. He's a Vichler. I don't even think I've heard of that. A Vichler is a Hungarian hunting dog. And, you know, we live in Florida. We have two acres of land. There's windows all around the house. And there's birds. And he's a bird hunter dog. Ah. So when he sees birds, he goes up mental. You mentioned earlier that Vanilla Fudge released a new single, Stop in the Name of Love through Golden Robot, which kind of ties into your big hit, You Keep Me Hanging On. You had mentioned that Tim Bogart was able to play on it. Uh, he passed away in January to brain cancer. Was this single release meant to be like a tribute to Tim? I, it started out, well, our manager had a deal for an album, maybe September, October of 2019. So it was going to be called Supreme Fudge. We were going to do five or six supreme songs maybe a couple other r&b songs and then a couple of originals so we started recording it in like a, the end of november mark stein had the idea for the arrangement we got together a few times you know rehearsed and, and put the ideas together you know everybody stuck their two cents in the arrangement and then we went and recorded it the last week in november and then i talked to tim yeah you know, and we knew tim was you know, had stage four cancer. And I said, Tim, it'd be really cool if you could play on a few of the tracks on this album. You know, you up to that? He goes, yeah, I would love to. I said, great. And at that point, he wasn't that bad. You know, just like, you know, 2019, he had the, he had the stage four cancer and he was going through treatments and everything, but he was still, you know, talking and going out to, you know, to eat breakfast and stuff. So we did that song. In January, when I went to the NAMM show, I said, well, look, why don't I put you on, Tim, on the song we already recorded, and then when, come after the name show, I'm going to go back to New York, we're going to get together and do some other songs. Maybe you play on one or two other songs. It'd be great. And he said, okay. So then we did that. I got him on the song. And he, you, know, you could tell he wasn't exactly Tim, but he played great on it, and we did the NAMM show, and then... February came and we started lining up to do the next song. But then I found out that the drums weren't good on it and I had to redo the drums on, on that song. So we were going to line up the studio time in February to do that song. And then it kept, it kept getting postponed. And then March came and COVID hit. And that was the end of the whole album idea. But we did have Tim on the single. So then, I don't know, some, a year ago, you know, we said, well, look, we got the thing. We got Tim on it. I have a studio now. I can fix the drums. Uh, why don't we finish that track? And the manager said, I'll, I'll turn it into a single for them. So that's what we did. You know, And then for the B-side, uh, my wife, who is uh, the radio chick from New York, she's uh, she worked in Boston, too. You know, She was one of the radio chick. She was uh, two chicks dishing on, on uh, WPCN, a morning show. It was Leslie Gold. Yeah. So that's that's my wife. We're together 19 years. So we said, well, maybe we should do a tribute to Tim uh, as a B-side. So she put together a tribute, an oral tribute to Tim. With me, Mark, and Vinny talking about Tim with music behind because that's what she's doing now. She has a podcast called A Life's Story, which was number 19 on the on these, on, I guess, Apple charts of... Uh, audio documentaries, you know. Yep. So so she so she's a good talker, she knows how to do it. So she put that together. So that was the B side. So the A side is Stop and Name of Love. If you go to Spotify, you can buy Stop and Name of Love and the B side was the audio tribute. So when we did the video for this song, I suggested my, I have the guy that does the videos. I suggested why don't we take like a whole history of the band with the film or psychedelic lighting and and put posters and pictures and everything, and at the end of it, put a pic good picture of Tim and dedicate it as a tribute to Tim. So that's what we did. And now we have another video that we're trying to get the label to re release on the same song, which was a 1968 movie that we did that never came out. 
sort of like when the Beatles did help, they're running around doing stupid stuff. Yeah, that, that was us. <laughs> we did that too. But we never released it. So I put it together with, with the video editor of that song and calling it Journey in Time slash Stop in the Name of Love. Journey in Time was the video and the music part. And Stop in the Name of Love was the actual vocals because we had the song going before we had the vocal on that song. Instrumentally, we rewrote all, all different chords and put this whole thing together. And then it happened to fit Stop in the Name of Love and with a few changes, you know. I sent that to the label. We're going to see if they want to release the, the video again with another video to the same song. If they don't, then I guess we'll just put it up on our website, you know, and maybe sell it at gigs or something, you know. You're out touring soon with Vanilla Fudge, or you're already out there with Vanilla Fudge? We've been, we just got back. Uh, we did five shows over the last couple of weeks. We did two on our own and three with Robbie Krieger, and then we got back uh, a week ago. You know, and then we're leaving tomorrow to go back to New York and we, uh, we go up to Buffalo on Friday and then we play Saturday in Buffalo and then we, then we play three more shows with Robbie and we come back on the 18th back to back home. So we got four more shows with Vanilla Fudge and I got an in-store with the singer from my Drum Wars band and we're going to be doing a, a book signing for my, my book. Yeah, all that stuff. So. Was it weird getting back on stage after being locked down for so long? It was. And the first time was with my brother. Yeah. And I did my drum solo the first time. I said, man, this sucks. Uh, what a bad solo. And then the second one was better. <laughs> and the third one was the last one with my brother. And I finally got back to par and kicked ass. And my brother went up and said, yo, what about my brother Carmine, a piece on drums? He said, who do you know who plays drums like that at 75? I mean, we had a pretty big crowd that night. It was good. So getting back into it, playing is nice, but it's one more case that's over for now, and then you know, trying to figure out what to do next year. You had an album come out this spring under the Cactus banner called Tight Rope through Cleopatra Records. Are you planning any tours with Cactus? Uh, we, we were going to do some touring, but then we had some problems with the client, with the personnel, the uh, guitar player had... Uh, carbon tunnel operation and it didn't it didn't, it didn't uh, heal up in time for the gigs we had it was going to be last week we were going to do them so and then the singer didn't want to do it because of COVID you know so I, I got a replacement singer and then the harmonica player his wife had a surgery and he had to stay home with her so I had to get another harmonica player <laughs> and one of the promoters didn't know the gig was confirmed so he didn't advertise I said you know what everything's telling me don't do these gigs now so we moved them to next year. We're trying to put the, uh, figure out the dates for next year for that. And then we're doing a new King Cobra record right now. And I'm going to do some King Cobra shows next year. And Drum Wars and hopefully Fudge. And we try to just play all my different projects, you know, Rod Experiences. I get to play the Rod Stewart stuff, which you know, I haven't got to play in years. I've been to uh, Japan, uh, uh, not Japan, China. Macau with that. I've been to different gigs on the East Coast, gigs in Texas. That was a lot of fun playing with guys from the Rod Stewart band, playing gigs and playing the Rod stuff with a guy that looks like Rod and sounds like Rod. Before we finish up today, I just wanted to ask you about your 1981 solo album, Rockers. It recently turned 40 years old, and I was listening to it this week, and it sounds pretty damn good. Thank you. It was, it was a good album. And from, from that album, Rod, you know, it was released on Rod Stewart's label. Yeah. So he came down to the studio a couple of times. He heard Danny Johnson and Jay Davis and ended up putting them in the second Rod Stewart group with me. Oh, that's because good. Because he liked the way they played. And then Jay went on, even after when me and Danny left, Jay stayed with Rod and he wrote that song, uh, Baby Jane, da 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 <laughs> He wrote that song with Rod, so, you know, it's, uh, my influence with Rod kept, you know, kept going, you know, from when I joined him, we did You Keep Me Hanging On, because he loved it so much, and I, I persuaded him to, to cut it, you know, I, I got him, I got him back with Jeff Beck, friends with Jeff, yeah. and we did Paper Get Ready together, you know, I got no credit for it, I was on it, I instigated it, you know, and, uh, Jeff was staying at my house at the time. And, you know, it, it's 
And I met with Rod a month ago. He, he has a place in Palm Springs. I said, look, I want to come to one of your gigs and play Sexy and Hot Legs with you. He was going, he was playing in Vegas. I was going to go to Vegas on the way to my daughter's wedding in L.A., but I never got an answer from him, so I didn't, I didn't book it. But now he's playing over here in February in Florida. So I'm going to see if I can get a hold of him to get me up there to play uh, Sexy and Hot Legs with him. Absolutely. I think it needs to happen. Yeah, so it'd be great. Yeah. But, you know, he's a good guy. He's a, He wrote the introduction to my book, The Forward. He wrote the, you know, the intro to it. And in there he said, uh, I find Carmine, you know, I, I, fuck knows why, he says in the book. I know why. He was doing too much drugs at the time, you know. Yeah. Drinking and drugging in the, in the 80s. Well, that seems to be the story with a lot of bands back in the day. But I like Rod. He's a good guy. He's so successful. It's unbelievable. You know? Well, I wouldn't count your career too short, Carmine. You've been on hundreds of albums, and I would encourage anybody to seek out your back catalog. It's so diverse between the styles and certainly the drum work. And, of course, your latest album, Energy Overload, with Fernando Perdomo under the Apathy Perdomo Project, is a great jam band album, even if jam band isn't your thing. And I hope you do really well with it. Yeah, thank you very much. Carmine, I want to thank you for coming on the Rock is George podcast. It's been an honor to talk to you today. No problem, man. Talk soon. Once again, I want to thank Carmine Apiece for coming on the Rock is George podcast. You can check out everything that Carmine is doing at CarmineApiece.net. I also want to thank John Lappin of Lappin Enterprises for making this possible. Check out Carmine's latest album with Fernando Perdomo on Cleopatra Records, the Apiece Perdomo Project, or app, if you're one of the young hip kids. And on Deco Entertainment, he has the 25th anniversary of Guitar Zeus. This is the ultimate package. Make sure you check that out. Uh, it was a real honor to speak with Carmine. I've been a big fan of King Cobra and Blue Murder for a long, long time. And I just discovered his solo album, Rockers, as I mentioned earlier. Fantastic album. Make sure you stream that one. You've been great. I've been George Dion. I'll see you again soon.